My name is Regina Hagen. I come from Germany and live in Darmstadt. That is not very far from Frankfurt, in the middle of the former West Germany. I grew up in the middle of the Cold War and in the middle of Europe and uh, some older people or people my, my age uh, remember the, the slogan uh, of a travel agency in the United States in the 70s and 80s, uh, travel to Europe while it still exists. That you know, is pretty much a mood in which I grew up and, and, and found very difficult uh, to cope with as a, as a child. Towards the end of the 90s, I had a chance to listen to Sir Joseph Rotblat, who was a founder of the Pugwash movement and the only scientist who participated in the Manhattan Project and left when he heard that the Nazis are not working on a nuclear bomb, which was his only reason to actually join this project. And he spoke in Darmstadt and was in his high 80s and talked about what is going on with respect to nuclear weapons. And I thought, hey, here is a task for me, here is something I can do. Roadblood was invited to talk uh, by a, a university group called Janus, Interdisciplinary Research Group on uh, Science, Technology and Security. Uh, and out of Janus, INESAP was created, an international network of scientists who work against proliferation. And they are the co-drafters of the Nuclear Weapons Convention together with other groups. I think there are a lot of scientists working in their laboratories and in their ivory tower. Uh, and I mean, most of them never bother about the effects of the science they do. There are actually scientists in the nuclear laboratories in the nuclear weapon states who firmly believe that their research has nothing whatsoever to do with nuclear weapons. But of course there are also other scientists, responsible scientists like Sir Joseph Rotblat, but also many others. And some of them uh, were, um, were networked in INESAP or worked uh, at the university in this Janus group. Uh, and um, they thought differently and they understood the topics differently and worked towards a solution for the nuclear arms race and the existing nuclear arms for solutions how could abolition actually come about. A group like ENESAP is, is like an interface between all this, between the political arena and the scientific arena and the activist arena and often even the philosoph uh, philosophical arena. So I think that is very urgent, uh, uh, urgently needed, this uh, ability to communicate. I actually think that women are very well represented in the peace movement, but often they are not the ones sitting on, sitting on, the, t on the panels or being interviewed or uh, being very outspoken. Very often they do more the work in the background and the sort of everyday business to keep organizations running. Uh, when, you, uh, when you observe uh, the number of women here at the preparatory committee meeting of the NPT, I actually think there is a fair balance between men and women, but they might have different roles. Uh, and to a certain extent, this might have to do with the reluctance of women to go actually go into technical and scientific fields. This like, sounds like a stereotype, but often it is actually true that it's women addressing the more human aspects and the men more addressing the technical aspects, not letting things come so close to their heart. Although this has been changing in the context of the nuclear weapons debate through the introduction of this catastrophic humanitarian consequences topic, which was uh, on, the, on an international scale introduced by Switzerland, the government of Switzerland and the Red Cross. Uh, but in the peace movement has been very much the issue of women and of the Hibakusha, of the survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, for whom it always was the topic, and of course also the IPPNW, the physicians uh, uh, who always addressed the humanitarian aspects of, of, of nuclear weapons and nuclear war. 
Um, so I think, you know, yes, we, we could do with more women, especially um, uh, in sort of the higher, higher spheres uh, and in the technical um, um, field. Uh, but there are a lot of women working in the field. Most young people don't know about nuclear weapons. Uh, but in that respect, there is actually not that much difference between the young people and the average population. Uh, uh, because um, in the mass media, in the media generally, nuclear weapons usually seem to be a problem when they are in the wrong hands. Uh, when, when, when they talk about Iran or in the past Libya, Syria. Uh, and now mm, possible nuclear ambitions of Iran, it's the wrong hands and that's what's talked about. Uh, and it, you know, when, when CIPRI, the Stockholm Peace Research Institute, come up with the latest figures, uh, the latest figure was there are still 19,500 nuclear weapons uh, globally, then there is a, a tiny little uh, piece in, in the newspaper, uh, often not on the front page, and that's it. Often they hear nothing about nuclear weapons. They hear not, not even about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They don't understand what a nuclear weapon is and what it means and how they still affect us. In Germany, people generally don't know that there are still US nuclear weapons deployed in Germany, that it's still an issue. But my experience is very often when they do hear about this, uh, and ideally through peers, through the same age group, not us elderly educating them, but hearing from others. And when that is combined with what, for example, the Ben All Nukes Generation Group is doing in the context of the NPT conferences, bring them to, to the UN, give them exciting things to do while learning about nuclear weapons, while talking to diplomats, while understanding what's going on, uh, that actually makes it attractive. Um, and I mean, not all the young people who go through, for example, uh, the bang uh, uh, excursions to the United Nations remain active, uh, but they understood the problem. I do think it's both. Uh, and uh, with an equal balance, because without uh, the political side, um, there would be no will for verification. So the political will uh, to actually agree on something that is to be verified, uh, I think is, is, is as important as the technical side, uh, scientists and engineers and other technical experts saying, hey, there is a means to verify. We can't verify this and that, or we need more research into this and that because we believe we can we can make this uh, this uh, become reality that we can verify. For example, a nuclear test. And then once the means are there to verify, uh, and I mean it's very very unfortunate that there were the two North Korean tests, but the CTBTO could show that the system al already can detect tests although they were very small because they didn't work properly and all this, but the system in place is actually good. So that increases um, the, the confidence of the politicians again in, in the verifiability. Well, obviously the greatest challenge is that the uh, CTBT is not in force, that, that there are countries who haven't signed or who haven't ratified, or both, um, and that it cannot enter into force without uh, the list of 44 uh, uh, going ahead. Um, so that is obviously a, a, a big problem. Um, but for the, the wider regime uh, and for the issue of nuclear weapons, I think just as great a problem is that some countries uh, simulate tests because they have data from thousands of tests. Uh, so they do computer simulations and they do the subcritical tests. I mean, it's not very convincing that uh, countries who tested hundreds of nuclear weapons 
above soil, below water, sub, uh, sub uh, under the ground, in the in the uh, outer space even, um, and have all the data that they use this uh, uh, to to continue development of nuclear weapons and modernize with a computer, uh, and then tell the sort of newcomers you shouldn't test. Uh, don't misunderstand me, of course, no one should test. Uh, but like the NPT regime as such, I think there is a, an, an imbalance. And I think that is uh, also a great problem uh, to the verification regime or to the non-proliferation and disarmament regime uh, as such. I do think it's a very important step uh, towards a nuclear weapons free world, which is what we all hopefully want. It can only be a first step and I am very frustrated with the speed of these steps. I mean the CTBT um, negotiations ending in 1996 and now it's 2012 and it's not in, into force. Uh, and my own government, the German government, always talks about the step-by-step -step approach. Uh, I think we can no longer afford this or we will talk about similar issues or you know uh, the next generations in 100 and 200 years. I think we actually must take bolder steps. Uh, and the group which I worked for, INESAP uh, uh, and, and uh, IALANA, IPPNW, other co-drafting this model nuclear weapons convention, there the CTBT, the prohibition to test, is just one of, of, of several obligations uh, packed into this whole framework. And I think this is what we need, or we will not make real progress. When I look at reality, I'm not very optimistic for very obvious reasons. But then I live in Germany and I grew up in West Germany uh, and there always was East Germany. And then suddenly the wall comes down and this is no longer the case. And no one had this on the agenda. No one thought that this would happen. So I do know that unexpected things can happen and that it's very much also a matter of grasping the opportunity. Maybe I can refer back to Sir Joseph Rothblatt with whom I uh, started out becoming so active, who sort of, uh, you know, um, made me feel this is urgent and I can play a little part in this. Um, when I met him first, I think he was 87 and he talked about the nuclear weapons free world. And I said, Sir Joseph, when do you think this will come? And he was a very small and fragile and old man with a very low voice. And he said, oh, I don't know. And he had this beautiful English. But I am sure that I will live to see the nuclear weapons free world. And, <gasps> you know, uh, and to me, this to me is like a legacy.